It's the real news. I'm Aaron Maté. Russian politician Alexei Navalny is calling for a series of protests and a boycott of next year's presidential election. This comes after Russia's Central Election Commission barred Navalny from running because of a conviction on fraud and corruption charges. Navalny says the case against him is politically motivated. He is often described as President Vladimir Putin's strongest challenger, even though polls show he has just 2% support. This comes as Putin has formally registered for the March 2018 vote, where he will seek a fourth term. Stephen F. Cohen is Professor Emeritus of Russian Studies, History and Politics at New York University and Princeton University. Professor Cohen, welcome. Let's start with Navalny. What is the significance of him being barred from running in the election? Uh, the way it's being talked about here is that Putin is trying to sideline his strongest challenger. Well, it's not clear he is his strongest challenger. As you said, Aaron, the polls, and these are not Kremlin polls, but fairly independent polls, give Navalny, <clears throat> if the election were held tomorrow, somewhere between two and maybe six percent. Uh, that would make him fourth or fifth. No, that's not right. It would make him third behind a guy named Zhirinovsky, who heads a very nationalist party and has run against Putin four or five times, usually gets about that, and the Communist Party candidate, who will not be this year, this time, next year, the leader of the Communist Party, uh, Gennady Zuganov, but a stand-on. <clears throat> and my guess is the Communist Party would probably get, if given half a decent fair shake, that is some television time, probably 10 percent. So Navalny, at least based on the polls, is not the strongest candidate. What he does have is a constituency, constituency that alarms the Kremlin, and that is young people, particularly educated young people, who like Navalny's kind of uh, in-your-face, uh, you're all corrupt, assault on the Kremlin. So he has real appeal in the country. Personally, as a Russia student of Russia, and having spent so many years following Russian politics, I wish they would put Navalny on the ballot because I'd like to see what he gets. It would be very interesting to know uh, what voters really think of him because polls, as we know, don't give you an accurate picture. They're using as a reason not to put him on the ballot that a person who has a is a convicted felon cannot run for, I don't remember whether it's any office, but cannot run for federal office. He has one, maybe one and a half felony convictions. He says they were political frame-ups. Here's an interesting sidebar, and then I'll let this go. The woman who's head of the Electoral Commission, her name is Ella uh, Pemfirova, is a much venerated civil rights democratic activist in Russia with a long history. Putin made her uh, the head of the Electoral Commission, and she was the one who yesterday or very recently announced, including to Navalny, that he could not be on the ballot because of the convictions. But she added, because she has a humane element to her, I wish I could put you on the ballot because I would like to see how many voters support you. But according to law, I cannot because your convictions stand. So formally and legally, that's the reason he's not on the ballot. Let me just end by saying it would not surprise me if the Kremlin figured a way to have his conviction reheard, the felony set aside, and put him on the ballot. Because Putin would have reasons to want him on the ballot. That is to get a bigger turnout, to infuse some excitement in an election that appears rather ho-hum. So I don't think this story is over yet, or possibly not over. But then that raises the question, do you think Navalny is is right when he says that the initial charges against him were politically motivated, designed to keep him off the ballot? <clears throat> well, the original charges were a number of years ago. Uh, my memory may not be accurate on this, but I think this goes back six, seven years before there was any talk of him running for the presidency. Uh, so I don't think the answer is they cooked up these charges against him so that four or five years later he couldn't run for the presidency. As for the second question, I have a firm rule. What I don't know 
I don't evaluate. I don't know if the charges were legitimate or not. I didn't follow the case that closely. I know it was upheld in the Russian appellate system. You may say that means nothing, but sometimes convictions are struck down. But I also know that the European court of whatever it is said it was a political conviction. Hmm. And you mentioned the communists. So they've chosen as their candidate uh, Pavel Grudinin, if I have that name yeah. close to yeah. right. And I think it's, I, I never heard of him, but I think it's Grudinin. But it doesn't Gardena. matter. Okay. Yeah. Well, so in, in terms of their platform, so you're suggesting that they have the strongest uh, chance of challenging Putin, even though it's widely assumed that Putin will win. But what kind of platform will they be running on to uh, challenge uh, Putin's agenda? Well, let me sum it up. It'll be social democracy plus Russian nationalism. That's been the Communist Party's attempt to build its electorate. Uh, the social democracy, or let's put it in plain terms, the old Soviet cradle-to-grave welfare state is much desired and much missed by a very large segment of the population, but mostly an elderly segment. Uh, the nationalism is, of course, a rising force throughout Russia. This was the case before the Ukrainian crisis. So the communists, even though it's not really compatible with Marxism, but they're not much more you know, they're Marxists, but of a special kind, have latched onto this nationalism, and they fuse the two. Here's the thing, Aaron. Back in the 90s, uh, you're probably too young to remember this, but the communists actually got, in a number of parliamentary elections, the most seats of any parliament in the Russian Duma, in the Russia, Russian parliament. They didn't have a majority, but they had the most seats. I vaguely recall about 27%. Putin comes to power in 2000, and essentially, he steals the nationalism from them. Because Russia's in crisis, there's the Chechen war, Russia's in depression-driven collapse. So Putin steals both the welfare state and the nationalism from the communists. And they've never done anywhere near as well as they did in the 1990s. My recollection is, is that in recent years, they got about 14% but fell to about 7%. I don't believe that number. Uh, all elections in all countries are more fair to some people than they are to other people. In our country, if you got a really lot of money, they're fairer to you. In Russia, they're fairer to the people who have what's called state resources, television and things like that. The communists have had none. I think if the communists were to get a completely fair shake, which would mean equal access to television, because as in this country, television drives elections, turnouts, preferences, that they would probably get close to 20% of the vote. Putin would still win. And let me end by saying on this point that the fact that they're not running their titular longtime leader, Zuganov, but a guy who's known in the country but not well known, uh, suggests to me that the communists have given up on the presidency and they see their base as, their future as, in the Russian parliament. And probably they're correct to do so. So, Professor Cohen, in the second part of this conversation, we're going to talk about the dynamics right now between uh, the U.S. and Russia. But since we're talking right now about the internal Russian situation, uh, I'm curious your thoughts on how Russians are viewing this whole Russiagate uh, so-called <laughs> controversy right now. Uh, you were recently in Russia. You studied the country closely. How are Russians, the ones you speak to, looking at this national obsession here in the U.S. Uh, and this widespread view that it was their president, Putin, who got Donald Trump elected? Well, the, the kind of anecdotal wise guy view in Russia is they can't fix the roads, but they could choose the American president. In other words, utter disdain for this story. But it has a serious consequence. I just read and your viewers might want to read a long article by Nadia Zhikina uh, that's just been posted at thenation.com, I think, yesterday or today, about the impact that this Russiagate story and the media malpractice in this country, which is absolutely, I think, unprecedented in modern times, is having on Russian liberal democratic journalists. It's utterly demoralizing them. They look to our media, I mean, they probably shouldn't have done so, but they have, as a model for them. And now they see the American 
media, and not just the media, but the so-called avatars of professional journalism, the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, wallowing, wallowing in the mire of media malpractice, and it completely demoralizes them, partly because they lose their model, and partly because the people who can control journalism in Russia in a negative way say to them, see, what are you complaining about? It's even worse in America. Uh, more generally, there probably are some people in Russia who believe the story that Putin, you know, the, the story that our so-called intelligence agencies gave us, though we now know it was just a few guys, maybe a few women, handpicked by Clapper and Brennan, that Putin issued an order to hack the DNC, take the emails, give them to WikiLeaks, and make Trump president. Or the story varies, just create chaos in America because he really wants chaos in America. It's all preposterous. There are no facts, no logic to this. But Russians regard this, uh, some Russians who want to believe that Putin is all powerful uh, probably take pride in this. You know, the Americans have pushed us around for 25 years. Now Putin gave a taste of their own medicine. And since we helped Yeltsin rig his re-election in 1996, that's what comes to a Russian mind. And we did do that. I was there. I watched it. There's even a movie about it. There are books about it. Clinton administration boasted on it. But I think most Russians who are educated, and there are a lot of them, critical-minded, and who can process the evening news, even if it is Russian propaganda, think the story's preposterous. They think it has to do with American internal politics and nothing really to do with Russia. That's the educated opinion in Russia today. You know, Professor Cohen, in the time we have, let's get into a little bit of that history that you mentioned. Uh, when we talk about, the focus right now is how Russia has allegedly been meddling in the US. But you've pointed out um, that even if all the accusations against Russia are 100% true, the hacking of the emails, these, the so-called social media accounts and the troll army that posted messages on Facebook and Twitter, even if all that is true, it would not be a fraction of what the U.S. has done in Russia over the past uh, 25 years, as you've been studying. Can you, in the, in the brief time we have, can you sum that up for us as best you can? Because obviously it's a very long history. Well, I don't know. I'd, I, I'm not sure I formulated it the way you did in beginning by saying if even all the allegations were true, because I can't find any of the allegations that have been factually verified. So I'm not sure I'd go for a counter hypothesis like that. But with the end of the Soviet Union, and I wrote a book about this called Failed Crusade. I published it in 2000. Large parts of it appeared in The Nation magazine. Uh, the subtitle was uh, America and the Tragedy of Post-Soviet Russia. Uh, the book detailed, and there were other books on the subject, not just my, my own, that essentially swarms of Americans went to Russian, Russia and decamped, and decamped in government offices, in uh, 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 universities, uh, and everywhere imaginable. And Americans wrote Russian legislation, wrote Russian textbooks or funded them, meddled, interfered in a tangible sense, not in this vague sense that we say Russians meddled, not sure what that means, but I was there in the 90s. I saw the Americans there. And this culminated in 1996 when Yeltsin ran for re-election. He was sick. He was faltering in the polls. Polls showed him with very little chance not only of winning, but making the runoff because you have to get 51 plus one vote, 50 plus one vote in a Russian federal election to avoid a runoff. It looked like he might not even make the runoff. Clinton administration mobilized people that we call, I guess, like Paul Manafort and people like that who ended up in Ukraine, election experts. They decamped at the presidential hotel. They were fully visible. Clinton arranged for Yeltsin to get, I don't remember the number, maybe $5 billion loan from the IMF to pay back pensions. And Yeltsin squeaked through. Uh, he would not have won, I think, without the American intervention. Now, at that time, it was considered a patriotic thing to do because his primary challenger was the one and same Zuganov, head of the Communist Party. Uh, but the stakes were very high. The Clinton administration had vested heavily in Yeltsin. Had he lost, 
that would have been the end of Yeltsin, of Clinton's Russia policy. I think it would have been a good thing, but it would have been a catastrophe for Clinton and for American foreign policy. So we did everything possible to get and keep Yeltsin back in the presidency. And he lasted a few more years until basically his health gave out and then came Putin. But that was the most vivid, uh, uh, observable case of truly intervening in another country's presidential election. And by the way, they boasted on it. HBO made a film, a feature film with actors and all. I think it's called Spinning Boris or Saving Boris, uh, which you could get on HBO on demand and still watch, uh, uh, taking great glee in how we had done this. And there have been books about it. So there was no shame, only pride. And Russians remember this when there are these vague allegations that somehow Russia was involved in Putin's, I mean, in Trump's election. Unlike Americans, Russians have a very uh, acute uh, historical memory. They remember these things. Well, on that note, we'll leave it there. And in part two, we're going to talk more about uh, this current situation between the U.S. and Russia and how Russiagate is uh, impacting relations between these two countries. Stephen F. Cohen, Professor Emeritus of Russian Studies, History and Politics at Princeton University and New York University. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. And thank you for joining us on The Real News.